Let me start first of all by thanking you for having me on this uh, uh, in this endeavor. My uh, research sort of has evolved from, from the global financial crisis. Right before the global financial crisis, three key digital technologies came about, which are, in my opinion, fundamentally changed finance. One of these technologies is cloud computing, another technology is blockchain, and the third technology is mobile telephony iPhone was introduced, Bitcoin was introduced, and uh, Amazon Web Services was introduced right around the same time. But financial institutions were not in there, did not have a possibility of actually incorporating, and they were pleasing the regulators. So that gave rise to fintech. So a lot of fintech companies started out, fintech companies that you know about, mobile-only banks that now exist only on your mobile phone crypto assets, decentralized finance, smart contracts, all of that, that basically are in some way competing with the established finance, with stock exchanges, with brokers, with clearing houses. These technologies were sort of powering, uh, powering the rise of fintech. What the global financial crisis did for fintech COVID-19 pandemic did for dark fintech. What I define as dark fintech is the use of digital technologies, same fundamental digital technologies for illicit financial gains, unregulated, uh, without your knowledge, stealing money from you, taking money from you, taking your identity, selling your identity, it, and, and that, that sort of thing. It, variety and variety of ways. How did it happen? It happened because as a result of the pandemic, a lot of companies had to go remote. And so all of a sudden you have lots and lots of individuals and companies going into cyber unprotected environments. If you go into a cyber unprotected environment, it's the same laptop on which you are processing payments. It's the same laptop on which you're ordering online. It's the same laptop on which your child is watching, uh, you know, cartoons. It is unprotected. Your Wi-Fi router is unprotected. Your VPN is glitching. And so that created a huge possibility for dark fintech. I think the main message is that cyber in the past has been sort of viewed as operational risk. It's something that could affect you. It's something that could do damage to your company, do damage to your business, and you provision for this. You have operational provisions for that, just like, you know, just the operational risks that you can have in the, in the physical environment. You know, you have, you know, doors and locks and, and, and that sort of thing. Now with dark fintech, my, what, what I think has happened is that it now has reached the scale where it's no longer an operational risk, it's a systemic risk. It could affect your company even if it's not part of what you're doing. Be aware and change your mind sort of around it. It's, it's much more than you think. It's large, it's a business, it has financial implications and attracts lots and lots of talent and lots and lots of money. So, and as a result of COVID-19, what basically happened is that so much data has become available that those dark fintech, they, they use algorithms to basically go after their targets or customers, were able to really, really get really, really good with those algorithms. They've become amazing, you know? You know, for example, you know, you, you probably get text messages on your on your phone from time to time or emails on your phone that are looking sort of better and better. You're finding yourself that you're like this close to clicking on that link, right? Eventually, they'll get you. It's just a matter of time. Eventually, they'll get me. So I'm an academic. So how do you get me? You know, if you send me something and you say, you know, you won the lottery, unlikely, you know. I'm a finance professor, I don't do lotteries. So <laughs> if you send me an email, say, I would like to invite you as a keynote speaker. I might click on it, 
right? I mean, it's become really that good. So educate yourself, be really, really aware. Also be aware of something called social engineering. What the social engineering type of attack does is somebody comes in from the outside, impersonates him or herself as being an insider, and then is able to do things on the inside. Those are able to penetrate basically the most sophisticated defenses that, that you can possibly have. Because once that happens, if you discover it, imagine this, that the person is actually impersonating someone who is part of your rapid response team in response to a cyber attack. So you contact your rapid response team, you're actually contacting someone who is impersonating them. So you don't know who to trust. That's the environment in which, in, in which now you need to think that you're upgrading, that, that you know, increasingly these types of attacks actually come and, 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 and they're able to penetrate you and pretend to be actually your employees, your customers, uh, your vendors, your security team. It's going to be a never-ending arms race, and you should be prepared that it's not going to be eliminated. It's basically reached a level where it's going to be, it's going to be with us for a long, long time. Understand not just your physical architecture or, or physical way in which information flows, but also, you know, how does information flow digitally? Who has access to what, when, how? Who are these people? How responsible are they? How protected are they? Do you know if somebody's always watching them. How can we verify that they are who they are? You don't want too many of them. You don't want too few of them. One of the problems with Twitter was that over time, you know, it's just the access to to uh, to uh, accounts was potentially granted to too many, uh, too many internal actors. And uh, there was no boss on top of it. They actually did not have a, you know, chief chief service security officer for many many months so these are one of the lessons you want to have someone in charge you want to have these people to be a team they probably already have it but sort of think of it as perhaps a new set of responsibilities perhaps a rethinking responsibilities large companies and probably your listeners do the uh, uh, sort of red team exercises so somebody tries to penetrate and pretends to be and see how far it goes your teams know that that it's uh, it could be for real it could be an exercise but but it's there it's it's you know it's basically it's, it's here to stay my main message is that if you are a leader of a company, you cannot afford not to be technologically educated. You just cannot be, you, you just can't. If you do not understand the enough about digital technologies, somebody, it's not going to be your business for long, or you're not gonna be the CEO for long because you just cannot do it anymore. You don't know where the possibilities are, where the frontier is. So, uh, the, the question that you're asking is, are we looking at the different types of people who are actually going to the leading companies? My answer is yes. Yes, because otherwise, you know, you are unprepared. You know, you put someone in a position who does not understand the technology, those people overlook something, the uh, risk materializes, and then, you know, replacement happens. So. Yes, there will be there will be individuals who are much much more savvy about technology. Potentially, they're you know digitally native in, in the in the future. They're comfortable with it, but also you know appreciate the risks that come with it. My name is Nicolas Trimbaud. I'm in charge of food prevention and Chief Data Officer for Cash Management and BNP Paribas. Cyber attacks are a major threat to businesses and organizations of all sizes in all geographies. Hackers are incredibly active, totally unscrupulous, and they are targeting everywhere in the world, SMEs, charity organizations, individuals, large industries, or service companies. For example, we as a bank are targeted every day. In that area, I would like to mention four trends that I observe. First, 
companies are more vulnerable than ever. As you all know, a new trend for our changing economy is that companies are becoming more and more digital, which is excellent, but also by adopting those new ways of working, like including working from home, it means also that they depend on more and more IT systems that are more and more complex. And this increases the, the risk of cyber attacks. The second third trend that we observe is that the financials and reputational repercussions of cyber attacks can be huge. Cyber crime has risen dramatically during the pandemic. And the global cyber crime increases like about 15% every year. It is estimated that by 2025, cyber crime will cost about 10 trillion US dollars every year. It's mostly related to identity theft or what you also call social engineering. There is the classical CEO fault. And we observe, unfortunately, several cases every month. And here the impact can be several millions euro depending on the company. I can mention an example that was public in the press last week in France. A company in the medical sector had suffered from a CEO case, fraud case of more than 30 million euro uh, for a few, a few payments just in one month. Another threat that we observe in fraud is a vendor scam, where fraudster impersonate one of your supplier and ask you to pay them on a new account, which doesn't belong in fact to the real supplier. We also see the fake bank technicians, where fraudster impersonate a bank employee and pretend to, to, be, do, to, to make some manipulations on your, on your account while they would not and they would steal money out of your accounts. I like to present a multi-layer approach. The more layer of protections you have, the better you are protected. And the first line of defense against fraud, raising employee awareness, implementing procedures. We as a bank, we provide awareness materials to our clients and in order to share best practices so, and I mentioned here a few tips. Uh, first, basic protection. Like for COVID, you need to wash hands regularly. Well, to protect from cyber risks and fraud risks, you should just not open links or click on attachments to suspicious emails that come from people you just don't know. And you should be aware of what we call email spoofing, where fraudster or hackers will imitate the real email of one of your counterparts, but in fact, a few letters have been changed there. So here, corporates will really need to train their, their employees regularly so that they are aware of the most common frauds and cyber risks, so that they are able to detect them on their own. I said also implementing procedures to validate payments. This is really important to prevent CEO frauds. What Foster will try to do is to tell you, please do not speak about uh, this important payment. This is strategic, this is confidential. Do not speak to anyone. In fact, here you should speak and you should tell your employees. They should not make a payment on their own. They should always seek for validation before making payments. Regarding cyber attacks also, you should think about having a BCP a business continuity plan in place so that if you are a victim of cyber attack, because it is not a question of if, but about when you could be, because everyone, as I said in introduction, can be a victim of cyber attacks, at least you are prepared. We do not oppose it at BNP Paribas, banks and fintechs. We believe, we believe there can be fruitful cooperations there. I just mentioned the fintech CCID. And while fintechs can offer expertise, it's also not a secret that fintechs are often more agile than banks. And each partner, bank and fintechs, can bring their own expertise and so that we can be stronger together to keep ahead of cyber criminals. We really want to keep 
all our resources focused on on keeping our uh, customers safe.